season. And I said, you know what? Duke and LSU is going to be the first game where you're going to see both catchers moving the ball, both knee down. And, of course, I get looks of, like, no, 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 no. Like, no, you're, you're full of shit. And you're like, who the hell are you? And sure enough, that first inning, both of them went knee down, started moving the shit out of the ball. That zone got a lot bigger. Welcome to Episode 10 of the Backpick Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Thomas. Today we dive into the world of softball, talking catching with Kirsten Cox of Dominate the Dish in Tampa, Florida. Kirsten works with a lot of girls down in Florida. She also is a consultant for a lot of Power 5 softball programs and their catcher's developments. Kirsten's really bringing a lot of new age techniques and analytics to a game that's been very traditional in its teachings of catching. She talks about how she did it, what she's up to. Most importantly, she does it with zero filter. She tells you like it is. And that's what we love about her. Hope you enjoy it. This is exciting for me. Um, we, uh, we started the Catching Academy about seven years ago. Um, I had, you know, one girl for about, you know, three years kind of in the beginning of that and kind of snowballed into two or three. And now we're up to about 2025. 20, um, we've hired on a softball instructor. Um, softball's become a big part of what we do. Um, so I'm excited to learn as much as I can here uh, from the softball realm. Uh, from here, Kirsten Cox uh, with Dominate the Dish. Okay, question number one. Um, we are obviously evolving, and I think, uh, you know, baseball is is using analytics to evolve. Um, softball doesn't have quite the access to the analytics that maybe is kind of slowing things down. Are we starting to get a little bit closer in some change with catchers in the softball world? Yes, Um we're starting to hire at the, the, the power five level. You're starting to see uh, positions open up like um, uh, directors of player development. So obviously I think we're starting to create more statistics in house, but in terms of public access, like baseball savant, like we're still a little bit off. Um, I have been seeing on Twitter, like softball cloud, uh, what is it like six, four, three, they're starting to post a little bit more statistics about analytics and catching, but I still think we're a ways off. Um, I'm kind of in a unique situation. Um, I'm kind of a third party with uh, certain colleges that, you know, I can, you know, dig into uh, Synergy, watch games. I can, you know, get the pen and paper out and start writing like the good, the bad, the ugly. But as we were just talking about before, like the change is finally happening. Like, when I first presented this idea back in 2019, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's a baseball thing. Like, the knee down's stupid. Oh, moving the ball is stupid. Like, that's a baseball thing. That will never play in softball. You know, so from going from 2019 to the 2020 season before it cut down, you know, I was working with Georgia Tech and going knee down against, you know, a Pac-12 team, Pac-10, whatever it is now. Sorry, I'm East Coast. Um that, you know, people are like, what is that catcher doing? Like, she's moving the ball. She's going knee down. And, oh, my gosh, like, what what's going on? And then COVID hit, and then nobody had anything to do. So everybody got on Twitter, and everybody started sharing ideas. God, I'm, like, zoomed out from, like, after, like, three weeks of it. I'm like, dude, I can't do this anymore. And also, I live in Florida, so we went back to work right away. Um, but I noticed more college coaches start following me and following baseball, catching people. And then all of a sudden we start having this little shift because everybody had like what a year of just learning how things were working. And then I told everybody, I, cause I got hired by Duke uh, that off season. And I said, you know what? Duke and LSU is going to be the first game where you're going to see both catchers moving the ball, both knee down. And of course I get looks of like, no, 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 no. Like, no, you're, you're full of shit. And you're like, who the hell are you? And sure enough, that first inning, both of them went knee down, started moving the shit out of the ball. That zone got a lot bigger. And I remember there was a certain pitch against Aaliyah Andrews, who's, you know, a professional now. I actually know uh, the Andrews family a little bit. You know, she, um, she got one pitch that had no business being called a strike. And I just watched Duke rip it back into the zone. And she just looked at the girl like, what the hell are you doing? My phone blew up. I had all these people being like, holy shit, you called that? 
And just ever since then, like, I think the curiosity has really sparked in the softball world. Because, again, like baseball, you know, there's millions and millions of dollars being spent in analytics. It is constantly thrown in people's face. Whether you like it or not, it's still there. So if you could find that little loophole in softball to take that advantage, like, it's going to amplify how much better you're going to get from a battery standpoint. So it's taking off. I just think in terms of public access to statistics, I still think we're a little bit off because we just don't have the financial resources and the manpower. I mean, I could be wrong, but also softball is a very um, sorority kind of feel. Um, It's, well, I'm friends with you. I have no problem sharing information, but if I don't like you, I'm not going to share the information, you know, go fuck off. Like that's, that's the bad thing about softball is it's unless you're friends with people, like nobody's going to share anything. I think we're slowly getting better, but there's a lot of gatekeepers in softball that want to keep it that way. So <laughs> that's kind of a harsh take, but that's I know a, a lot of people would agree. And honestly, I get a feel of that, um, you know, being in the baseball side, um, I do at times get a feel of, you know, softball being like a little protective um of their game and kind of uh i'd say want but like you know there's a little bit of a desire to be different than baseball to have their own identity and uh my question to you is because again i am a a baseball person i'm learning softball i think the game is obviously in my opinion it's the exact same minus the fact that pitcher throws underneath the arm instead of it's on top And it's the idea that there's obviously going to be different angles created because of that. um, And we might have to match different planes in terms of how we're receiving. But what are for you as catchers, softball compared to baseball, what are some variations that are different that, you know, we as instructors that are kind of doing both may have to look into? I mean, I think the workload capacity um, you know, I'm not super familiar with baseball per se. I mean, that was crazy as I played baseball when I was a kid, but, um, I'm 34. So times have changed, you know, like these girls are playing seven to nine games in a weekend. You know, I don't think baseball on the travel ball side is doing that. I mean, are they, are they playing seven to nine games? Uh, I mean, not that many. Uh, there's, 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 there's not nearly as many games going on in baseball, but I'll tell you the the softball thing is, is out of control the amount of games and and the other piece is the amount of games that these girls catch you know and i think i feel like there's you know again kind of the idea of like some pushback you know like oh you know hey these girls are tough and they can catch you know six seven games in a weekend and it's like (laughs) well yeah they are yeah i mean they are tough and that's great you know i i think that you know they, they definitely can do it. Uh, should they do it? That's another question. Yeah, I I, I preach at my workshops because, you know, I travel around the country and, you know, I just, I really hammer to parents. I'm like, dude, like, you know, I want, I understand that you want your kid to be the all-star and, you know, catch all the time because, you know, you're shit up money for training and gear and this, that, and the other. But it's just like, you know, I tell girls, I was like, do you want to be fresh? you know, game seven, as opposed to grinding it out, one, two, three, four, five, six. Like, if you're playing in game seven, there's a there's a solid chance, like, hey, you're playing for something, you know, whether you're a ring chaser or not, you know, but, like, the workload capacity is just absolutely just terrible across the board because I see it on Twitter. So, you know, I encourage parents to be like, hey, like, if your kid takes a game off, it's not the worst thing in the world. It doesn't mean your kid sucks. Your kid deserves a break. You know, and especially for us right now, um, because I could be wrong, but Florida doesn't have, like, a law in place that you can't play travel ball during high school season. I know certain states, it is just shut down. You get caught playing travel ball during high school season, you're suspended. I believe Ohio does that, um, but I think Georgia... We're we're like that out here. Yeah, I mean, like, last year, I had a kid, um, you know, play JV, and they were like, well, we still want to get, you know, game reps in because JV wasn't, you know, doing much for her. So they played travel ball on the weekends. That's seven straight days of just nonstop catching, throwing, hitting this, that, and the other, you know, and it took a toll, you know. So 
I just the game thing is just something different that stands out between baseball and softball. Obviously, base runners, you know, guys can leave whenever they want. Girls on base can't leave until release, but good base runners are leaving close to foot plant because it's just so damn quick, you know. So there's some differences there. Um, obviously, our bases are a little bit shorter. Our game is faster. I mean, shit, we can almost get two games in over a course of one game. Um, but again, like you said, the pitch trajectory, like understanding those things. Once you identify those things, I it, it's interchangeable. You could teach softball. I could teach baseball. If you can understand the differences from that and just have it up front from the get-go, catching's catching. Like, I've preached that for a very, very long time. You know, you know that I'm not popular in the baseball world, but a lot of baseball catching instructors know who I am. And we don't have beef because, you know, I understand what your game's about. You guys understand what my game's about. So... There, there's no conflict of interest, I guess you could say. But, I mean, like I said, the game thing just really stands out with the differences in baseball and softball, especially on the prep side. Like, it's just, it's crazy, and I hate it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. So what is kind of your, what has been your influences, um, you know, as you've kind of molded something different in this game? Because, again, we used to see the the body move stick, uh, the you know, whip and a lot of that, you know, <laughs> like the l- l- legit, exactly like legit framing, um, of pitches. Right. So you obviously kind of evolved. What were your influences in terms of kind of what got you to make some of these changes? Uh, um, and then talk a little bit about that process, that process of like kind of being a little bit different and new and, and changing the game a little bit. Well, um, to be honest, I would say, what would it be, about 2015, 2016. Um, I have to give credit to Zan Barksdale. Um, You know, anybody that's catching knows who he is. Um, Honestly, I forget what I was doing at the time. I I think I was just doing lessons. I was a high school coach, I think. Um, Not doing too much. Um, I was also selling engagement rings, too. Most people don't know this. I had a side gig. Uh, before I went softball full time, I sold engagement rings for five years. Um, but I I, nice. I saw this. Um, I think it was a post on Twitter. No, it wasn't Twitter. Um, I think it was like Facebook or something. It said Catcher Con. I was like, okay, like this is kind of cool. So I DM'd him, and you know he's like, yeah, this is what it's about. Blah 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 blah. And I was like, okay, cool. So I signed up. I drove. Um, I got in my Jeep Patriot. Drove up. And I went to sit down, of course, like, if you've been to CatcherCon, like, Friday night, most times, except for this year, you're not doing much on Friday. You just sign in, you sit around, you shoot the shit with everybody. Um, Of course, I was that person that was the first one there. I think I was actually the second person there. Um, Tom Griffin was the first person there. Um, So I sat down. Of course. Yeah. So I sat down. And, of course, like, deer caught in headlights. I'm like, this is badass. Like, you know, there's a bunch of baseball people in here. Like, holy shit, there's MLB guys in here. Tom Griffin came up to me, and we started talking. He shook my hand. He's like, hey, it's really cool to have, you know, a female here. It wasn't just a mom. Like, it was just a softball person. So, like, listening to Tanner, uh, Billy Boyer was there, you know, talking about uh, middle infielder play. Craig Driver, obviously Tom, Zan, all those guys like talking about, you know, receiving and like throwing and all this other stuff. And I'm like, dude, we don't have this in softball. Like there's people in softball, but they don't talk about it like this. And I was like intrigued by the knee down and then started digging into that. And then obviously the glove manipulation coming next. Um, But I would have to say CatcherCon has been my massive influence with changing how I think. And I was like, dude, if baseball's doing this, why can't softball do this? And for me, I'm some peon in Tampa, Florida. You know, I was hopping fences to be able to use fields because our fields are locked up in Tampa. Um, you know, so we were shimmying through fences. We were playing on, you know, we were training on fields with fire ants and weeds all over the place. You know, we were using awnings. Like we were doing some sketchy ass shit to get this stuff in. I mean, hell, there was one time I was in a facility. I showed up one day. It closed. Like, the guy just shut the doors, didn't tell anybody. I walked in. Everything looked like it had been stolen. I was like, well, shit. Like, you know, fuck it. Like, let's keep going. Let's go find a park and let's get after it. But I'm like, what do I have to lose? 
you know, I'm just some peon from Florida. I was an average Division II player at best. I'm left-handed, you know, with zero career home runs. And I'm a big girl. Like, I was just, I didn't have a pedigree of a standard, per se. Like, I don't have my playing career to put this threshold on me. I'm just, like I said, some chick in Florida that, you know, was just doing lessons. And I'm like, dude, I really like catching. And in 2015, 2016, there really wasn't catching coaches. Like, there really wasn't. Like, so, like, I kind of took off because everyone's like, oh, like, you're an actual catching coach. You're not just somebody that's, like, tossing balls and, you know, catching. I was like, no, like, dude, this is what I want to do, um, you know, but I want to be a college coach. So, you know, I was keeping that on the back of my mind, and then I became a college coach. And then I'm like, fuck it, I don't want to be a college coach. I don't want to, if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of a renegade a little bit. I'm like, I don't want to answer to anybody. Like, I don't want to teach hitting. I don't want to, you know, call and book hotels and shit. I don't want to do that stuff. I'm like, dude, I don't really want to do is catching. Like, that's it. So when I left, I'm like, I'm going to go all in. So going to catcher con, start following all these baseball people, following, you know, pitching people too, like driveline and tread and all them. And I'm like, Dude, I might have something going on here. And then by 2019, obviously, you know, I'm going in on the knee down, a little bit of glove manipulation. And then now you have that going on. I got my own building. I got rid of lessons. I don't do lessons anymore. I opened up a facility that they were in there for an hour and a half to two and a half hours doing everything. They're receiving, they're blocking, they're throwing, they're lifting, they're doing arm care, they're doing mobility work, they're doing recovery work. Like we're doing game film, we're breaking stuff down and it's just, it's snowballed and snowballed and snowballed to what it is now where people are like, dude, we appreciate what you did because you started from the bottom, like you had nothing to lose. You went all in for five fucking years and I don't want to say build an empire, but it's just like building this reputation, regardless of what you think about my demeanor and my language. It's just like the proof's in the pudding. Like these kids are getting better. These programs are getting better. You know, team ERAs are going down. Strikeouts are going up. Strike, uh, strike probability is increasing. Like all this stuff. And it's really opened the eyes in the softball community, especially on the catching side. Like, dude, it's great to hit. Like, don't get me wrong. But if you could serve so much value to, behind the plate defensively, your offense can take a little bit of a hit, but, you know, slumps are going to slump. You're eventually going to get out of it, but defense never slumps. Like, it, it doesn't. Like, if you got a good catcher back there, you're going to be in a good position to win a lot of ball games. So, like I said, baseball's really just hammered my philosophy. I mean, 95% of the shit I get is from baseball. So... So talk a little bit about that that training environment that you've created. So number one, I want to hear uh, how you come up and devise a plan uh, for athletes. So is there like an evaluation process and then you devise a plan? They know what their plan is every day they come in. And then also, just like you talked about, the different things you have going on and creating a little bit of that competitive, uh, you know, work hard environment. So, um, cause I have a couple new kids right now. We just started this baby bottom feeder program. Um, it's more for Caitlin. Uh, it's kind of a, a filter system for the little ones. Cause I get messages from parents all the time. Like, Hey, my nine-year-old wants to work with you. And I'm like, a nine-year-old has no business with a 17, 18 year old on some nights. Like I let a lot go on. So I was like, let's, let's create this environment. So typically what we do um, for like the first couple weeks is they'll come in. Um, I have no parents at the facility. Like I just don't have the space. It's just, I also like it from a mental standpoint, like cutting the cord with the parents. Like I even joke with the parents. I'm like, they're going home with you and they're not getting in the car with me and driving two hours north. I'm like, they're getting back in the car with you. So drop them off. They'll text you when they're done. So they'll come in and then they'll put their bag down and give them a tour. Nothing super crazy. You only have 3,000 square feet. So it's like, ooh, look at this shiny little area. And then there's a couple back rooms with storage and TV and stuff. Um, so they'll come in and I'll just like walk them through and be like, hey, here's our velo board. Here's our warm up board. I have a massive warm up board that has everything. I believe in individualism with how you want to warm up because every kid is different with mobility. Everybody's got previous injuries. Everybody's got this, that, and the other. So for the first couple of weeks, uh, we take it slow. Like I even tell the kids, like I have a new high schooler that just came in. I'm like, you're going to feel like you're not accomplishing anything, 
but just trust it. I don't, I, I don't necessarily like the whole trust the process thing. I'm like, just trust what we're doing. Like, just give me a couple weeks and let's see how it goes. So we'll warm up. Um, we go through some hip mobility, some back stretches, some ankle mobility. I call them animal movements, like your typical duck walks, just to kind of see how they move. Um, you know, seeing if they're walking, you know, flat footed, seeing if they're on the balls of their, excuse me, balls of their feet. How does their setup look? Are they leaning to one side? Are they standing? I'm just paying attention to those kind of things. And then we'll work out, which, you know, I'm not a strength and conditioning coach. I can't afford it. However, you know, I do have a fairly decent idea of things that they can do without a barbell. Not on touch a barbell. Um, like the chaos balls, the slam balls, like things that I don't want to say are idiot proof, but things that can just really help generate a lot of power and also explosiveness as well as balance, stability, agility, power, all that kind of stuff. So we'll go through that and then um, we'll start arm care stuff. So we'll slowly progress into like J bands. Everybody knows what J bands are. Okay. We do wrist weights. Uh, we use Chad long horse spinners um, just because I just don't have the space to have a bunch of, you know, shoulder tubes laying around. And then we'll slowly introduce them to like reverse throws, momentum reverse throws, upper body isos, just to kind of see how they're feeling, which 99% of the kids are like, wow, my arm feels great. I'm like, yeah, because you're not doing damn wrist flicks and running, you know, three laps around the field and calling it a warm up. I'm like, this is, this is a process. So we'll get into that. And then um, I usually break throwing down, like everybody does the same thing, but I give them the freedom of how much they want to do. So, you know, everyone's like, oh, I got an individual throwing program. Like, we're not trying to throw, like, splitters and cutters and curveballs. Like, dude, we're just trying to throw fastballs. So, you know, I don't necessarily program specific drills to the kids. Now, if they want to do something else and be like, hey, what can I do for this? I'll, I'll interject and I'll walk over and be like, hey, let's try this as opposed to this. So I break throwing down into buckets. Power, skill, and flow. Flow is just getting your arm loose. You've probably seen them like figure eight patterning. You know, you've been seeing like the slide and goes, all those kind of things just to keep tempo and pace. And the kids are intrigued by it because you would never see them do that at a practice. Like they'd be like, yeah, my coach would think I'm a dumbass if I'm like crawling around and doing all this shit. So it just changes the environment of how I approach throwing as opposed to just picking up a ball, throwing it as hard as I can, doing throwdowns until I'm, you know, my arm falls off. And that's been an issue with throwing for a very long time with catching. It's like, oh, I want to work on my arm strength. Well, you go to the ball field and you do snap throws down to second and do snap throws to first and third, you know, pickoffs, whatever, and butt coverages. Oh, that's not going to increase your arm strength. Not all, not, not necessarily. You need the overload and underload uh, principles. So we'll get done with that. We'll do a full recovery. And then I'll be like, hey, what do you guys want to work on from a skill set standpoint? You know, we got – Three hack attacks. We got two baseball machines. I got pretty much everything under the sun. So I let them have the freedom of what they want to work on. They'll be like, hey, like last night, a um, bunch of them came in from after high school practice. They're like, dude, I just want to work curves today. That's all they said. I just want to work curves. They do a couple rounds of curves, and then they'll change it up and be like, hey, I want to do some quick transfer stuff, just you know, maybe a handful, and then I need to get out of here because I got to do homework. And I'm like, okay. And that's just the structure of how we do stuff. Um, but like I said, the warm-ups are on the board. I give them the freedom. They can pick and choose whatever they want to do. But and the skill set stuff. But the throwing and the lifting, I kind of hone in on like, hey, everybody's doing this, everybody's doing that. You know, obviously we can vary weights. You know, like I have certain kids that can do 20 pounds with the shoulder with a dumbbell with the shoulder press. I'm not gonna have little Maddie, who's nine. She is in my regular group, but she's been with me for three years because she was working with my high school kids. Um you know, she's not going to pop up a 20 pound dumbbell. She's going to have a five pounder and just, you know, sit there just to get her proactive. But, you know, in terms of that stuff, I am doing a better job at keeping track of it. I'm going to be guilty of like, I used to not write the shit down. And then I'm like looking back going, shit, maybe I should have wrote that down. So now that I have Caitlin on board, like we're making sure that we're logging and tracking progressions a lot better. Um, we've always done throwdowns. We've always done pull downs and standing, like tracking. But now, from the lifting and the types of drills that we're doing, I'm doing a better job of that. And I have seen the difference in the kids too, because now there's more variation in the lifts a little bit. It's awesome. 
So let's dive into some uh, mechanical stuff catching wise. So talk a little bit about the one knee stance, uh, how you utilize it, what benefits you're seeing. And then I like to hear the difference that you're seeing between right knee down and left knee down. So knee down, um, I like it for my bigger girls. Um, I've in the past dealt with kids that are like six foot tall and obviously six foot tall women are, you know, a rarity, especially on the catching side. They usually get thrown into being pitchers and first basemen. Um, so I like the knee down for balance and stability purposes. Also, you know, the types of pitchers, you know, are they living down in the zone? You know, are they a drop ball pitcher? Are they a drop curve? You know, do they throw the change up a lot? Do they, you know, locate their fastball? you know, a little bit more down the zone. Cause anything hung up in softball, dude, you make contact with these bats, dude, it, it's not that hard to hit the ball 200 feet. Like, you know, I'm probably going to get schooled by hitting people, but you know, it is what it is. So I like the knee down for that. Um, also too, like the pitch trajectory, like, dude, that ball is not that far off the ground, you know? So getting your eyes fairly eye level with majority of where those pitches are going to go, it's just going to set you up for more success also allows you to be a little bit more calmer and also look at the umpires too. You know, we have, you know, more females behind the plate. You know, we have shorter men behind the plate. So, you know, we have to give them a good visual. Like, obviously I want to make their job harder, but you know, when you got a six foot tall catcher, that's, you know, sitting straight up and you got a woman that's like five, 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 six behind the plate, Dude, your head is almost directly in her eye level. So you're impairing her judgment just a little bit more. Like that could be hindering you too much. Like you want to hinder it a little bit, but if she can't see, you're fucked. So um, that, that, that's just how I see the knee down. Um, like I said, you're seeing it more. It was happening before 2019. Like people don't understand. We were going knee down. We were just dropping the knee as we were catching the pitch. So we were getting this like late action and a lot of people when they were doing it, when they were dropping the knee, they were bowing it in. Well, if you bow your knee in, dropping your knee down, guess where your body's turning? It's turning this way when the ball's here. So you're just giving your body signaling off certain angles that might not be the most ideal. I'm a big fan of keeping my shoulders straight. I want my shoulders to be like this, where you see girls that are doing the lean, the whip and nay nay. You know, they're creating these crazy body angles, and I think it's doing more harm than good. Um, you know, I posted on Instagram, like I was watching one game. She was not going knee down, but she was doing that gangster lean, and then she tried to manipulate the shit out of the ball. And it's just like, dude, the umpire's like literally seeing the whole thing transgress. Like, he's not a complete idiot. And then the catcher gets pissed. Why does it not call a strike? Well, you're not giving yourself good angles. So that's why I like the knee down is just you're on top of the plate. You're giving that presentation and perception that you were on top of the plate. So trust your glove because your glove is going to move a hell of a lot faster than the body. So if you already take some of that component out and less stress, I've also had it from girls. They're like, I feel calmer behind the plate going knee down. It's one less thing that I have to do over a course of half a second from that time that ball's released to the time it's in my glove. Like half a second is not a lot. So you're expecting to step out, move, drop a knee, move the ball, and do all this shit in half a second. It's nearly impossible, you know? So start cutting out things that will help eliminate, you know, distractions. And I think the setup is one of them, you know? Oh, well, you're setting up too early. Dude, I have kids that are knee down, and they're catching rise balls off of that shit. Like, don't give me that, oh, you're setting up too early bullshit. Because we know damn well pitchers do not always hit their spots. Like, I know, especially in baseball, MLB, guys aren't hitting their fucking spots. You're doing one of these numbers and hope it's relatively close. Softball's, I think, a little bit better. I don't have the statistics behind it, but, you know, you're, you're not giving it away. Um, in terms of left knee and right knee, um, I don't necessarily see a lot of catchers go right knee down. I love it because I like it from a throwdown uh, standpoint because you're seeing it a little bit more with baseball. Um, I do have a kid, a 24 uh, catcher that's committed to an ACC school. Um, she does go right knee down, and it's sexy as hell when she gets into a right knee down and she's hamstringing a guy, uh, hamstringing a girl, a, a right-handed batter that you know inside on a pitch. She just manipulates it, but her body looks like she's over the plate still, and she uses it as I've told kids that do the right knee down or even left knee down. 
Like, use your knee as kind of like a borderline of where you think the strike zone, how far out the strike zone is going to be. So if you're right knee down, setting up inside, wherever your knee is, that's where that glove needs to go. It needs to go back inside your knee because anything outside of that, it's going to be a wall. So that's how I utilize the right knee down is giving it a buffer on inside on right-handed hitters. Um, you know, left knee down, you know, girls like it because they're a little bit more open with their gloves. And I'm speaking from a right-handed standpoint because I am a left-handed catcher. Um, so it's a little weird for me, like, thinking about it. If, you, if you're not noticing, like, my eyes are rolling up, I'm like, okay, I don't want to sound like a dumbass because I am left-handed. So I'm like, I'm like going like this a little bit. But the left knee down, obviously a little bit more coverage with the glove. Um, you know, we talked about it at catcher con, you know, it's a little bit easier to throw from the knees, uh, left knee down. You know, we talked about it, pinning that back foot to create leverage, to create space, to create that coil, that load hinge, whatever you want to call it, to be able to get a little bit more juice out of your throw. Um, the right knee, I like it for standing throwdowns. Like if you know, cause most people think, oh, you throw faster from knee down. I, from what I've gathered from my kids and just overall seeing it, it, it's truly individualized. I have several that throw harder standing. I have several that throw harder from their knees. So if you can identify those, that can also help dictate what kind of setups that you need. Because if you got speed on base, you need, you need to get yourself in the best receiving position, but also the best throwing position. And that might be for a couple of them, right knee down. You don't see it very often, but again, you know, there's no absolutes and nevers. Let the kid work out of it. If she feels comfortable out of it, let her throw the piss out of it. But you're also not giving up the main thing, which is catching. Because you're receiving that ball, you know, what, 70-something percent of the time? Why are we giving up on that? Because you think she's going to steal. You don't know when she's going to steal. And if she does, give it your best shot. Because odds are, you got to factor in the shortstop. you got to factor in if she left early. you got to factor in, you know, where the umpire positioning is. Your grip, like there's so many absolute variables that are out of your control that, you know, get in your best setup. So I'm, I'm working a little bit more with the right knee down with a couple kids, but we train them all. I want them to go left knee, right knee, traditional in our training. And then in game time, I treat them like adults. You make the decision. It's your career. It's your game. It's your opportunity. What are you going to do? As opposed to me being a robot and being like, you can't go right knee down. You can't go left knee down. You can't go traditional. Two years ago, yeah, I was that asshole. I was like, dude, you're going to do everything knee down. And now I've kind of regressed a little bit back into, again, being individualized. I have a few that are just super mobile. They can get to that low pitch in a traditional setup. I'm not going to buck them on it. They're still going to train it. But then in a the game, I'm going to let them do what they need to do. I think the one of the things about throwing from the knees in softball, obviously, you know, much easier with the shorter bases. Um, I've always found it difficult, uh, even just in a traditional, with the the right uh, the throw from the knees because the body is moving to the right foot, mm -hmm. so it becomes a little harder for girls to consistently get their shoulders turned. Mm -hmm. So I've always taught, even in traditional stance, I want them to move their right foot underneath them when they're throwing from their knees. So as that ball's in the air, they slide their right foot underneath them. Automatically, their shoulders are going to turn a little bit mm -hmm. and they're going to have that center underneath them, just like we would from our feet where we hammer that foot right underneath the chin mm -hmm. as best we can. Right. And so when I've, when I've, I've always taught that, I love that. I think it's super important because again, we're throwing from the knees. We don't have as much from the lower half that, that upper body and the torque and that, you know, hip shoulder separation we create, in terms of the shoulder turn is super important and trying to move that whole turn to your right foot is much more difficult than bringing your right foot back to the middle and making the turn. So now that we've gone to more right knee down, well, now their right foot is underneath them, mm -hmm. right underneath their butt in that position where they are centered. Mm -hmm. So now it's legitimately let the ball get deep. We can just turn the shoulders and fire and not feel like we have to make, you know, like you said, left knee down a little bit tougher where we kind of got to, figure out that hinge and getting into that position right knee down is almost like just get the shoulders turned and get the ball out and airborne. Do you see that too? A little bit. Um, I do not teach my kids to reset that back foot. Um, I actually allow them to, I'm, I think I'm the only one that does. I think <laughs> no, I'm the only I've, one that does. I've seen a few people do I, it. I, I get different. I've, but... see, I've seen a few people do it. Um, just for me, I teach my kids to obviously coil and hinge back. I'm like, I'd rather you have, 
a split second longer exchange by getting back a little bit more. But if we can generate an extra mile an hour or two of velocity, because I'm team velocity a little bit, that if we can create and generate that Me power. Too. Now, if you do have a kid that just does not have the arm strength, I understand the reset. But, you know, my kid, like, that is a main priority for me is, like, I want my kids to throw the piss out of the ball. So, you know, if it takes a split second longer to load back, say their exchange is a whopping eight as opposed to, like, a seven, 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 but they're throwing two to three miles an hour harder, they're actually decreasing their pop time, if that makes sense. So we train in that sense, but I have the sure. reset. Now, you actually got me thinking that that reset might actually work for some of my kids that are still in the growing phase of the velocity. Like, you know, I have certain baselines that I'm like, guys, these are certain baselines that you need to hit in order to kind of put yourself in that top tier. And I do have a couple that are starting, so I might actually play around with that a little bit. But, yeah, with the right knee down, um, especially standing, like, you know, I've told kids, like, for us, because you have the batter in the way, you don't know where she's going, like you just got to catch it and get rid of it. I'm big on how quickly can I reset that back foot, which would be under center, and go. Where you see a lot of softball catchers, when they get out of their crouch, they try to gain ground. Like they try to uh, go after second base. I'm teaching my kids, get straight up, reset, throw the piss out of the ball. Get up, reset, throw. Get up, reset, throw. So... I understand with the right uh, right knee down. We actually call it uh, sprinter starts. So we do a lot. Every week, we do reverse sprinter starts or sprinter start throws with the 16-ounce ball. So that way, they learn how to get their legs under them because a lot of them like to lunge. They like to collapse. They like to gain ground, which takes time. Kills the velocity, too. So uh, I'm with you on the right knee down. Um, working in terms of that. We just do it in our throwing drill work. And then, like I said, I got a couple in a game that will actually do it from there. Um, actually, I'm thinking about it now. The 24, when she does throw from the knees, it's just a quick, just get separation and just let the ball fly. Um, she throws more, not a sidearm slot, but, you know, she's a little bit more out to the side. But, again, she throws the piss out of the ball, doesn't have arm injuries. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, because everybody's like, oh, you need to get your arm slots in certain positions. And it's just like, I'm, I'm getting more and more into, like, everybody moves differently. Everybody's slot's going to be differently. You know, what's your glove side doing? Your glove side, you know, counteracts with what your arm slot's doing. Like, but, again, the average Joe doesn't think of that stuff. It's, oh, let's just keep doing throwdowns and think that it's getting better when that could be doing more harm than good. Like, you need to build the whole engine. And that's something I pride myself in is building the whole engine of the catcher. So I am obviously a baseball guy speaking on softball, so you can take it for what it's worth, but here's <laughs> my hot take. Um, there is no reason in my opinion for softball catchers to catch on two feet ever. <laughs> so you have, obviously, I think it's undeniable at this point that we receive better from a knee down. I don't think anybody can really argue that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the reality is, is that there's not a lot of blocking uh, that is rangy, mm -hmm. right? That is as lateral as we see more of that in baseball. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can throw from our knees easily and more accessibly, there's not a damn reason in my mind to have somebody be on two feet. <laughs> and again, I, I, I wish I could get all my girls to buy into this. They don't, yeah. right? And that's okay. Because again, like you said, it's their, it's their deal, right? Mm -hmm. But as I look at this game and the way that it that it's played, uh, for me, I mean, it is it is like absolutely game changing for them to be able to number one get underneath the ball, right? Create really they have so much movement down on pitches that are so different than baseball too, right? I mean, the drop is, I mean, that is a firm pitch that has depth to it. We got to be able to get down to that pitch. So again, the receiving aspect, you know, massively different, but they are now seeing the ball so much deeper. Right. And I know we're obviously doing things different now, but like you look at the old school of like moving to the ball. Well now, like we, when do we have to move? Right. What's the timing of that? 
Yeah, or blocking and, and super kicking out, right? And it's like, well, then if I'm kicking out, that takes some time. When do I have to do sure. that? And when I'm knee down, able to receive block from there. Yeah. Yeah, that knee down receive block is like, I'm now able to identify this thing so much later. And we've gotten to the point where, you know, I'm trying to, obviously softball is way harder than baseball. Baseball, they're watching major leaguers do it, mm -hmm. right? Softball is like, they got coaches here in high school that are still telling them to do these old school things. And we're, we're fighting a lot of that. Right. But the reality becomes they need info. And so we've started just this week, literally, you know, uh, had Colin Wilbur on, we were talking about how he, how he charts guys and things like that back when he was in high school. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of like, we're literally charting guys and saying, okay, here's what you did receiving and blocking from the ready stance. Here's what you did receiving blocking right knee down. Here's left knee down. The reality is, is that blocking is similar, if not better from a knee down, but there is a glaring difference between the receiving in all three of those stances. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that gets neglected so often, right? It, I think it's because it's not, because it happens so much. And like you said, it's not quantified. Like, you know, think of blocking. You fuck up one time. Oh my God. Like, I can't believe you missed that pitch. Oh my God. Why didn't you throw her out? You had her out by a mile. Whereas like receiving, like, you don't get that feedback like as much now for me. Yeah. I will sit and I will watch that shit over and over. But again, we're in a different realm with that. Um, you know, like for me in workshops, you know, like, you know, I, I, I post a lot. So when I get these kids they are like, Hey, my high school coach, you know, wants me to do this. I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, what's your suggestion? I'm kind of a smart ass. I'm like, turn on the TV, go, go watch ESPN. Go watch softball. Well, you know, uh, university has some local peon university, you know. Oh, they don't do that. Watch the MFers that are top 10 in college softball right now. Watch the ACC. Watch the SEC. Athletes Unlimited. Athletes Athletes Unlimited is a must-watch for our softball catchers. Every time it's on in the summer, I'm like, are you watching Athletes Unlimited? You can go on YouTube and watch it. I mean, it is, it is not what – traditional softball catching has been and they're the best in the world at what they're doing they're getting better and i think this next crew of catching that's coming in that you know we're seeing at the collegiate level i think is going to trump that as well because you're getting more hybrid i guess you would say hybrid caliber catchers they're not your typical sally sue meat truck like me that is a big ass girl that's literally dropping tanks and just literally sitting back there and just catching the ball now you're seeing speed on the bases, you're seeing kids hit with power, hitting, sl slapping, throwing the piss out of the ball, moving the ball, range. Also, they can play other positions too. I remember when I caught, it was like, dude, you're either catching or you're a DH because you are a liability everywhere else. Now you're starting to see these catchers that would catch one game. <laughs> I know. It was, I played first base, and when I went to Eckerd, the sun like set right in front of the first base, and I was like, Fuck that. Like, I am not playing first base. Nope. I will hit. I will sit. I don't care. I'll mentor the freshman catchers. I'm like, I am not playing first base. Um, but you're also seeing, like I said, catchers play in other positions. Like, I know a couple schools that I'm working with, like, they have their number one, but their number one could go play right field if needed or go DH. So now they're creating this battery. And that's the other thing that I'm seeing in college softball is they're developing an entire battery. They're not putting all their eggs in their one catcher anymore. It's like, dude, if something happens to that number one, my number two and number three need to be ready to go. And they need to be roughly around the same range of ability because, like I said, the receiving piece. If you got a girl that moves the shit out of the ball as your number one and then your number two is more of a traditionalist, now you're giving the umpire a totally different view. You're giving your pitchers a totally different view. That's mental that could fuck somebody up. Like, you know, you went from somebody that's getting those pitches outside the zone to shit. Now my catcher's hamstringing me because she doesn't think it's a strike. Like, so that's why I think this next generation of catchers is just going to be a better across the board, whether they play professional here or over, you know, team USA or over in Japan and all this other stuff. I just think the athleticism and the overall ability of the catcher is getting a lot better. But like, like I said, you know, when I do these workshops, you know, I've instituted, you know, implemented, sorry, implemented 
um, video breakdowns before we even get started. I'm like, hey, I'm just letting you know these are the universities I work with. They allow me to share this information, which is absolutely huge because they could be gatekeepers like some programs are like, no, don't be sharing our shit, you know. So I'm like, hey, this is what these guys are doing and take videos if you want. So if your coach comes in and be like, I don't like that because the University of blah, blah, blah doesn't do that way. Well, guess what? Maybe I don't want to play at the University of blah, blah, blah. Like, that's what I tell my kids when they go to camp. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, how was camp? And they're like, well, they wanted me to change everything. Well, maybe that's not the maybe that's not the school for you. Because I'm telling you right now, there's going to be programs that are going to absolutely love what you do. They love your pedigree. They love your metrics. They love everything that you're about. Well, guess what? It's a learning experience. Just don't go back to that camp. Like, it, it's it, it's not it's not brain surgery. You know, just like with the high school coaches. Turn on the fucking TV. You got social media. Use it to your advantage. Stop scrolling at freaking, you know, TikToks and shit of teenagers dancing. Like, or whatever the hell that's going on, whatever's all the rage right now in social media, you know? Like, what was the one where you got out of your car and you were doing, like, the Kiki, do you love me thing? Instead of watching that shit, watch the clips of, like, what we do. We post a ton of shit. It's not like we're posting for clout. We're posting it to try to educate you. And, you know, I feel like we do a fairly decent job of describing of why we're doing it, you know? Go above and beyond of what, what your pay grade is. You know, I get some of you coaches are just doing it because you want the extra three grand a year or you truly love the game. Well, if you truly love the game, you'll let these kids do what they are working on. They're working with people that know what the hell they're doing. Well, most people, okay? <laughs> they're they're trying to impress they're trying to improve their game. Because scholarships, what, we're having schools closed down, we're backlogged because of COVID, the kids are getting better, the the you know, the gap between, you know, elite Travel ball teams versus the local team. Like, there's so much division going on right now. These kids are going to do whatever it takes to make themselves stand out. So you as a coach, why are you hindering them? It's their career. It's not yours. Like, Absolutely. I, I'm the same way. Like, if it's close, Absolutely. And, and I, think, too. I think I think it's interesting because, you know, what high school staff of softball or baseball is going to have a qualified catching coach? Right. I mean, that's just, that's just a hard thing to find in general. Right. So you're like, you should be like, man, this is awesome. Like we got a program here in, in the area of Tampa we're in that, that is going to train catchers. Cool. I'm just going to say, Hey, what's Kirsten working with you on right now? Mm -hmm. Just let me know how I can help along that process. And again, we still got to be results oriented and the kids got to be realistic about that too. You know, but coaches are so quick to, like you said, Oh, one pass ball. Oh, you know, if you had, if they were on two feet, you know, it'd be, oh, they would have blocked. Well, no, that. they wouldn't have. <laughs> they don't block everything on two feet too, yeah. you know? And that's the part. And I think, you know, he talked about like creating more of catcher cores, you know, and groups of catchers now and having more. Well, like the reality is, is that a, there's a lot of wear and tear on these girls' bodies. By the time they get to college, they've already caught too much. Most of the time we see the girls that catch at younger ages, they are the better players because it's obviously something that you have to have some ability and a little bit of, you know, fearlessness to be back there. So they usually end up being better hitters. So then when you get into college and you have these girls that are, you know, hitting three, four and five in their lineup and they're catching for you, well, they probably shouldn't be catching every day because then when you get into the playoffs and into going to the world series, they're tired, they're worn down. Let's take it back to the one knee. Now, okay, a little less wear and tear on the body, probably a little more beneficial to start using one knee. We've seen that with a lot of professional, you know, catching coordinators I've talked to have said, our guys feel better at the end of the year now. They don't feel as beat up. It's easier. We do blocking drills in here. I'll make them do ready stance, you know, in their secondary stance block. And they're uh, like, can I grab some water? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, go ahead. Grab some water. If, the, if we go right knee down, left knee blocking, they're not even tired. Yep. They're not, they don't, they don't need to stop. They don't, you know, take a break. They don't say we need some water. It's easier on their body. Um, and I think that's another piece of it where when you talk about having more depth at catcher is like, let your best hitter that plays catcher, let her, let her DH, you know, and hit a couple games on the four game series on the weekend, you know, and have some depth for somebody else to be able to step in there and catch. Yeah, I mean, shit last year, um, you know, I'll, I'll even say it like, you know, Emma Kauf is one of the better catchers in softball. Like it's, it's been a known fact. It was nice having two catchers behind her that can catch a midweek game. Give her a freaking break because now you got an ACC competition. You're going to go play Duke. You're going to go play Clemson. 
but you're playing somebody during the week where it's just like, dude, give Emma a freaking break because now we're going to, I hate the word grind, like tomorrow I'm going to Atlanta. They play six games in three days. Do I expect Emma to catch every single one? I don't know. I'm hoping not, but again, I'm not the coach. I'm just the third party that, you know, works with the catchers and stuff. But we also feel confident that if we need to throw somebody else back there to give her a break so we can have her bat in the lineup because she uh, was first or second in doubles last year, you know, first team all ACC, all region caliber catcher that can go play outfield or go DH or do this. Like, it's only serving your team better. You know, we talk about catchers being servant leaders. Well, shit. If you need me to go catch in another position, uh, go play. Sorry, go play another position. I'm still serving the team. I'm serving you with my bat this time. Let somebody else take the reps off of me. Because again, you're seeing it, especially you know when you're getting into super regionals. You're seeing the sloppiness with the glove. You're seeing more pass balls. You're seeing the lack of offensive because they're fucking gassed. Like I, I see shit on Twitter. You know, coaches are like. I'll never forget, what was it, 21, where they did the four-game series in the ACC because I'm friends with um, now the hitting coach at South Carolina. He was at Duke last year, and we were talking about it. And I said, hey, how was the four-game ACC bubble? And he's like, it was fucking brutal on the kids. And then you got these travel ball coaches. My kid catches nine games in a weekend. She got no problem. Motherfucker, have you ever caught in college? You know, the pregame prep. All the logistics, the media, this, that, and the other. I'm sorry, travel ball does not even come close to what a college athlete has to prepare for for a game. And they did four games in three days. But yet, you're comparing apples to oranges with a kid that caught nine games, probably chugged a Mountain Dew in between games, grabbed a hot dog, you probably threw in a bathtub at the hotel with ice and said, suck it up, buttercup, because there's ten colleges watching you play. You can't compare that shit. So, like, when I see that stuff, it just, it, I hate social media sometimes. But, you know, I just, I just feel like it's one of those things where it's like, it's a knock on, like, it's like we're, we're saying you're not tough because you can't, yeah. you know, because we're telling you not to catch nine games. No, like, again, I love that girls want to catch nine games. I was the same way as a player. I never wanted to sit out, but my coaches had to do what was best for me and say, dude, relax. Mm-hmm. It's a double header. Take a breather. You know what I mean? And it's the same thing. We as coaches and parents, like just because, you know, we, we want them to be tough or whatever, doesn't mean that they have to catch every single game. That's not what's, what's best for them. And you got to factor in bullpens. You got to factor in warmups. These kids are catching pitching lessons, whether they're getting paid or not. I mean, I made 15 bucks an hour back in 2009 sitting, you know, sitting on a bucket you know, also at the time too, you know, I was like 23 and dumb. I'm like, yeah, I could still squat. And I was freaking still squatting, catching pitchers that threw 10 times harder than what my pitchers did. Like, you know, they are just constantly squatting. They're constantly just doing something catching related. So, you know, I, I have that talk with them. I'm like, cause they'll come in and be like, well, I only caught three games this weekend. I'm like, well, how many games you played? Seven. I'm like, I'm not mad. And the newbies are like, oh, I'm pissed. I should be catching every game because the other catcher sucks. And then my veterans that will come in, they're like, yeah, it felt great to only catch three games this weekend. But, you know, I caught three. I did good. Hit the shit out of the ball. Did things. And we have this, you know, little sticker decals that say pew pew. You throw somebody out, you get a sticker, uh, sticker decal. And, you know, we just engage in those conversations. And for my college kids, you know, like one's at a Juco, she's fighting, you know, to go to a four year next year. You know, she's take, you know, she's taking her opportunities in stride. You know, I have one that's more role, uh, sitting in more of a DH role. And I was like, dude, when your number's called, I said, you're not beat up. Just be ready to go. Make sure you're doing your stuff. And she texted me yesterday. She's like, hey, you know, I grabbed the plyos out. I made sure that I'm getting ready for the weekend because right now they're just playing on the weekends. Like, these kids have been ingrained of how to think outside the box as opposed to the traditionalist of, oh, you need to catch nine games every freaking weekend for 12 months out of the year. You need mm-hmm. to be, you know, hitting a bucket of balls every single day. Like the shit that you constantly see on social media. You're like, is that really doing, is that really the best thing for that kid? Because you don't know the backstory of these kids, you know? So I just, I think it's getting better. I just wish it would get better faster, but I'm only one person, and I got a shit ton of stuff on my plate, so I can't necessarily always be the one to take the looks from the top. 
um, because also I can't really, you know, defend myself as much anymore because I'm in a different role, um, kind of like um, major league and minor league coordinators. They can only say so much. I'm kind of in that position now working with major universities. So, you know, I have to bite my tongue, but I'm slowly starting to see some softball people that I trust. Um, there's not many of them, but, you know, they're stepping up and taking the reins of, you know, spreading the good word, I guess you could say. I love it. I love it. Okay. My last question on every podcast, I'm a foodie. So I like to hear, uh, your favorite place to eat, uh, where it is, wherever it is. could be, obviously it sounds like you live a little further from your facility. So facility where you're at now, it could be back home in Ohio. Uh, Give us a, a favorite place to eat that pops into the head. Just one. Cause you can obviously tell I like food. No, 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 not just oh, one. Oh, shit, man. You can have as many as you want. We we want all the recommendations shit. we can get. I'm trying to, like, build a map of, like, best places to eat in, uh, so, in, in the baseball softball world. If you're ever in BFE, Ohio, this would be Lima, Ohio. Um, that's where I'm from. I'm actually from a small town outside of it. Sam, my girlfriend, thinks it's terrible. Um, Cupies. Cupies is the best burger place there is. It is the oldest fast food restaurant in America. You can Google it. Basically, what is it? Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, actually stole the square patty idea from the owner of Cupies. There's three in Lima, and then there's one mm. random one in Michigan somewhere. So Cupies is my go-to when I go home for the holidays. Um, trying to watch my weight a little bit. I'm a big Portillo's fan. Give me two jumbo chili cheese dogs with cheese fries and just layer it on with some diabetes Sprite. Like, give me like 3,000 calories after a long freaking day. I'm a Portillo's person. I also love sushi. I can crush probably like four rolls like it's nothing. Because uh, when I do workshops, I don't like to eat. Like, I am so lasered in focused that I'll be like, shit, we just worked out for eight hours and I didn't eat. So I will binge on sushi. Like I said, Portillo's. I my parent, my dad was um, the president of SYAA, which was like the Youth Athletic Association. So we spent a lot of days in the concession stand. So we are a typical nachos, chips, pizza, hot dogs because that was left over for the ballpark. night. Ballpark, ballpark oh, foods. Oh yeah. So when I get yep. to go to ball fields and stuff, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, hell yeah! I don't want chicken fingers. I want a hot dog. Like I want the good shit. Give me some peanuts, like. I just I grew up around baseball. Um, I used to go with my dad when he played slow pitch. I used to. It sounds crazy, but when he went to slow pitch games, you know the kids would all hang out behind the fence, and it's corn behind because I'm from Ohio. It like children of the corn. You'd be waiting for home runs to be hit, and you grab a ball, you run it back, you take it to the concession stand. They give you popcorn. Like those are just things that we grew up with. But we are definitely big foodies. Um, also, red meat can't turn down a good steak. Um, I do eat a lot of chicken, but I am a steak person. If I can get a good steak with some sushi, um, big card person too, being from Ohio, got to have potatoes, any type of potato. I'm all in on it, except for sweet potatoes. I don't like sweet potatoes. It's, it, it freaks me out a little bit with them being <laughs> orange. So, but yeah, so QPs, Portillo's, and then, like I said, sushi, steak, potatoes, uh, I'm all in. I actually do not care for pizza. It's weird. I think it's because I had it so much as a mm. kid that I got burned out on it. Also, ham. If you give me ham, I will literally just kind of fling it the other way. I do not like ham whatsoever. But again, we had it a lot as a kid. So burned out. Interesting. Burned out on pizza and ham. It just doesn't do it for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Like I said, uh, you know, softball resources in the catching world are are tough to come by. I think you're, you're one of the best out there doing it. So to be able to come on here and, and help our students out, it's pretty awesome. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that, be sure to like and subscribe. We'll have a new episode for you every single Tuesday here on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts.